soul continues to observe the being, observe the human aspect and interact with it to the degree that it does, to the degree that it finds interest, to the degree that it finds aliveness, to the degree that it finds wonder and curiosity in the human being. The soul is little interested in those things that go by rote or those things that have been examined or overly examined in past life. Now the human aspect of the being is a little bit to the contrary of that. Oh, the human likes its routine. You see, although it may be a subject for another time, the human aspect was created, yes, created and evolved, yes, evolved, to work, to toil, to make, to work and to work hard. Now that is of less interest to the soul. And that is not to say that the soul is a lazy thing. The soul is curious. Oh, the soul wonders at the universe, at the dark skies and at the light dawn. The soul wonders and sees and observes and takes in and participates to those things that are new, to those things that are young. And so the soul coaxes the body, the being, the human aspect forward. It insists that the human look for the curiosity of those things. It does its very best to instill a natural wonder. But of course that is not always the case. There are some humans who are truly, truly, and for their own sake and for their own learning, more interested in one subject, in the one thing. And there at times they will remain for a year, for many years, a lifetime or more than one lifetime. The soul then, that original curious, wondrous thing that it is, must be in partnership with the human. But if it cannot, if it cannot establish a bond, then the soul will leave, in essence, the human to its own devices. Now, we must be careful here. It is not that the soul will abandon the human, for... A soulless human being could not be, could not do. But the soul will move into the background of that life. It will not offer itself in the greatest scheme. It will not sort through the records of life, helping the human to put this together with that, to accomplish, to discover, to create. So here you have lives that are seen as less than creative, less them purposeful, if you like, or those that have less than life force. Perhaps you have seen those that seem to wander a little bit aimlessly, as if they have lost something, forgotten something, and even forgotten what it is or how to get it. In some cases here you see those that have been set aside by the soul. Now, remember that the soul, then, is the aspect of aliveness, that is, the human then is the mechanism. It is the human being mechanism that is the tool of the soul. If the soul then cannot animate its tool, then it goes about assisting other humans. Do you see? So the soul then continues to learn and through others by offering guidance to others, by bringing moments of serendipity or goodwill here and there. The soul is and must be what it is. It must continue to animate, to discover. It is not a driving force so much as it is its very nature. It is the nature of the soul to observe, to be, to discover, to create, just as it is the nature of an angelic being to be the embodiment, if you like, of compassion. All things to their nature, you see. So a soul, in essence, is always, always also at work. But its work is to be alive. 
Its work is to further aliveness, to keep all things then in movement. The movement, the majesty, the harmony, you see? After all, what is it keeping in movement? It is this. Now, the soul then continues to work to animate all things human, to look through human eyes and to see the world as humanity sees it, and in its own way to improve upon that, to make it better. Imagine that every human thinks to itself to leave the world behind a little bit better than it found it. This is not exactly a human characteristic as much as it is the soul's characteristic, you see. So the soul through the human being then seeks to improve its world, improve its body, improve its surrounding. Wonder to yourself perhaps when a human will say, hmm, I wish to eat healthy or to sleep better or to have better patterns. This is not entirely, again, a human characteristic. It is a characteristic of the soul. The soul infuses the human with this and the human part begins to think that way or feel that way because it now has desire. Desire comes from the soul. True desire comes from the soul, which is not the same as to say want or need, which is a human characteristic. So you see here we make certain distinctions, differentiations, so that you will see as you observe yourself or observe others, is it soul at work or is it human at work? Now the best way to decipher this is that the human aspect is that which is tied to the earth. Human then must be responsible and care for its body. It is the human being's body and it is the soul that observes or works through the human body but it is not tied to it and it is not limited by it or for it. The human part then must care for its own grooming. It must care for its own livelihood. It must care for what it will ingest and expel and like that. Here the human in this very basic sense is exactly that. The soul then, well, that is the exquisite part of being human. The soul is the human being. It is the part that is. The soul can be at home almost anywhere and almost at any time. And that is not to say that the human will always make a grand home for the soul. Sometimes it is in fact a very hostile environment that the human creates and offers to the soul. It is the discontented human that will create such a hostility then and say, there, live with that if you can. And of course, the soul is not a malicious thing. There is no battle here, but the soul will withdraw. The soul will withdraw. It will move into the background of one's experience. It will observe from afar instead of near. It will lend its support, but in the more basic sense, not in the sense that will bring the luxuries of life. So begin to look about your life, sweet ones, and see whom do you see and whom do you know? How alive is that being? Where is the soul in the process, at the forefront, at the background, observing off in a corner or to the side? And here it will give you a clue, if nothing else, of how each being is put together, assembled, if you like. Now, as we continue, the soul itself then determines the next period of growth for the human, as long as there is progress the human will accelerate, will be accelerated by the soul. The soul will cause there to be an acceleration of the senses, an acceleration of the awareness. The soul will observe the life of the human and will accelerate the being to bring clarity, to bring a new level of excitement. How does it do this? Literally, it excites just one small tug in the corner of a DNA, if you like, and all of the molecules and atoms become excited enough that everything changes. The emotional body and the mental body, and even what one would think of as desire, one smallest tug 
from the soul and the human will change its life, will change its course, will change its direction, will change its appearance. Almost everything can change almost overnight. So you see the soul must have nuance. It must understand subtleties and it must understand what is the capability of the human vehicle that it has chosen for itself. And that is why the bonds of early age are very, very important because they will determine then lifelong just how connected the soul is and how it can assist its human self and how it can assist itself in its own growth. The soul then causes the acceleration of the being of the greater truth, and the greater truth then awakens. What the soul does in essence is simply a little awakening, a little awareness. As you might imagine, the smallest bit of sugar in a young one makes for an exaggerated difference at times. It is the same with the soul's effect. A very exaggerated change can come about. So the soul is quite careful in its observations, in its nudging. And at times, yes, it is a course correction that is necessary. And at moments it will seem as if quite a severe lesson has been administered to the human self. Never is there a time where the soul will castigate the human. Never will the soul harm itself. You see, to harm is to do harm upon itself. And here, if you like, a karmic bond is created. A karmic bond is not always created when the human creates or causes harm to another, for instance. It is also created even when the soul in some way causes harm to itself or to its human counterpart. So an experienced soul and most are, understand how to join and how to navigate and how to keep the awareness, the bond, the frequency at the highest level possible. One of the ways in which the soul does this is to truly allow and in fact to assist the human during the rest periods. Do not wonder what you truly do when you sleep. Do not wonder how much rest the body actually needs. Certainly not as much. And so it is the soul then that continues to animate and to direct, to bring lessons, life lessons, frequency lessons, to join together, to piece together at times bits of wisdoms and truths and alignments to the human being, particularly during times of rest adjustments are made, particularly during times of dream. These go about the easiest. The soul then continues to observe the human being, to make time, to mark time, to guide it, to enlighten it. How does a frequency improve for a humanity? It is not always by adding light. Sometimes it is simply by subtracting the smallest quality that changes the tone of light or of life, the tonal quality of life. Just as the seasons change one by one, affecting all things during that season or all of the kingdoms, the soul also has its many seasons. And it is this subject that we have been addressing then. The soul addresses the seasons through humanity, through the vehicle, understanding that every decade, every generation, every period of growth, every discovery is meaningful and is important. And yet some are a little bit more malleable than others. Some seasons a little bit more creative. In some seasons, there is in fact more light, more truth, more awareness, more growth, a growth spurt. Just as there are growth spurts in the human body and the human being, there are growth spurts where the soul is able to accomplish so much more with the human being. One of these growth spurts then comes about in the twenties, in the twenties, in the early twenties, beyond the teens then and into the early twenties in some beings. Here, why? 
Well, the young adult then is so curious about life. Here it sees all things as possibilities. I can do this and I can do that and I can go here and I can go there. I can, you know. And so the soul endorses this. It endorses the can versus the cannot. It endorses this by releasing into the human body, well, almost, yes, endorphin-like qualities that allow the young human, the young man, the young woman to think the world of itself and the world of the world around it, to see the world as its oyster as it would be, to say, oh, yes, I can do anything. I can go anywhere. I can become anything that I choose. And so the soul assists that. It works with that energy. It accelerates that. Now, it is important that you do not think of the human aspect as some kind of a puppet, for of course it is not that. It is, however, a machine, a tool, an excellent aspect of all that is. The most beautiful, the most competent, the most practical, the most useful, which is why the soul has engaged it. But it is the soul, make no mistake, that is the director of this. It is the soul that instills in mind, not brain, but mind, a new thought, a complete thought, a creative idea worth exploring, and, as well, the ability or the pathways by which it can be accomplished. This perhaps is why you will see that there are many in their young twenties, mid-twenties, taking grand chances in life, to go about life with abandon, as it would be, knowing that all will turn out. Well, the odds are not as good that all will turn out when one that is too young or too old goes about certain adventures, but at particular junctures the soul knows uplifts, assists, and joins energy patterns, accelerating all things, so literally it almost seems as if the young human can walk on air, and oh how arrogant they become, as if they as well think, in fact, that they do walk on air or water, or what it would be. Of course, this will be tempered later, but that is not the point of these young years, these are a different formative years then. And here is a grand possibility for those that are able for the soul to join with human, to fuse together and to be one. So for those that are willing and able, here is a time where the soul is able not only to look through the eyes of human, but to become one with it. Here is one opportunity for true merging. Where there is merging points at these particular crossroads, the soul is able to infuse into that life awarenesses gained in other lifetimes. These cannot be brought about in all moments or any moments. There are indeed specific junctures in which it is more possible than at other times. You see, there are indeed movements in which the soul can orchestrate a leap if you like. Yes, that is an excellent word, a leap. Not simply a walk across a threshold, but a true leap, whether it is in a consciousness or a desire or an accomplishment. And so the soul will time itself accordingly, making this available to human and soul together. These crossroads then, just as the word implies, brings together a variety of roads where the past meets the present meets the future, where the non-physical meets the physical, and where all awarenesses come together in the way that they do. In these moments then, here is an accelerated moment, an accelerated time, and both human and soul become excited about life. Things are seen differently, more openly. Perhaps even one that will have a closed mind later in this moment, they are more open-minded than at any other time. For just as the soul is able to see through human eyes in these junctures, in these crossroads, the human is able to see through the soul's awareness, through the soul's eyes, as it would be as well. Even what you would term the third eye becomes quite awakened so that the human sees this. It sees through that eye. It sees through the portal eye to the inward 
worlds. It turns itself inward. And yes, at times you see those that in fact turn the world around. They're in that moment deciding all of a sudden what they will do, what career path they will follow, what direction they will take and like that. Well orchestrated by the soul. Now there is a great deal of free will associated here as well. So it is not as if the soul will dictate and say to the human, now that we are one, this is what you will do and here's your purpose and your life path and your life plan. No, it is a moment in which the two become one and one can see the outward aspects of life as well as the inward aspects of life then allowing all things to turn to their natural cause so that one can explore another or the next here you have creative will then explorations and true moments of desire coming forward at times, it will seem momentarily that the soul, after it infuses its light into the being, will take a back seat again as it would be. And the young human will then say, but why? But where? Just a moment ago I was clear and now I am not. And it is not that at all. But you see, the soul must then see what the human has attained, if the frequency will hold as it would be or if it will simply become aimless again without the soul's continued infusion. So it is important as the soul works with the human life to take a step forward and then a step to the side and then a step back, even as a young parent would do with a child that is learning to walk, hands out, ready to guide, but allowing one to falter just a little bit, not so that harm will come to them, but so that they will gain strength from their own choices, from their own decisions, so that they will become stronger in the process. And that is the soul's code, if you like, to infuse strength and wisdom, to bring forward will and creativity, so that purpose is born, not simply given. You will see, and perhaps you have heard yourself say at times as well, but what is my purpose, but what am I to do here? And the answer is not always forthcoming. The answer is present. It is always present, but it is not always given. For the soul has not come to lead by the nose, to say, follow this way and now this way, and now a left and now a right and now a pause. No, it is the soul that comes and says, look at the wonder of all things. You may choose from all this. All of this is within your frequency. All of this is within your ability to attain or discover or call forth. Choose it and I will assist you. Move forward, and I will guide. Be blind, and I will wait for your eyes to open again. So you see, it is a well-orchestrated life that is both guided by the soul, awakened by the soul, and at the same time, allowed to be, to be, to come into being, to discover one's own truth, one's own merit, and the soul will then guide but gently. The soul will both lead and follow, but not by getting in the way. It is the soul that does not shout, sweet one. The soul will carefully guide, you see? Now then, as the twenties continue, the soul becomes very excited, but there are many different possibilities all to be considered. And here is a time where purpose for the most part is forming, it is guiding. So not always is purpose given by birth. It is not always that one will know what one's whole life purpose will be at birth. This is an error. It is not always the case, but it is sometimes the case. It is sometimes the case because many lives, as we have said earlier, are lived in sequence, a sequence of one and two and three and more. If this is a sequential life, then it is a little bit more obvious what the soul hopes to accomplish in that life. But remember as well that the soul does not arrange itself in a linear way. So it does not matter quite as much to the soul if you three comes after two or eight follows seven. You see, it matters that the experience becomes a live end, a wake end, and the soul is a dimensional, a multidimensional being. So it need not arrange first and then last. 
And so the soul continues to unfold itself, unfurl its wings as it would be within the young human, studying possibilities and awarenesses and in a way teaching, yes, teaching the human how to draw to itself, how to draw the breath deeper, how to sustain a thought so that it becomes an idea how to expand upon an idea so that creativity is breathed into it, how to call to itself the elements that are needed in order to bring aliveness to that idea so that it will become a physical experience, so that a desire can be made manifest. And so in these years, in these years in particular, the soul infuses into the human the ability to manifest, to call to itself, to experience, to say, I can, I want, I will, I do. It is the time of becoming then, and it is a very important time of bonding for the soul. Most of the time this happens also without a hitch, we could say. But at times as well, there is a disposition either on the part of the soul or of the human where it is not simply an excellent fit. So there is a struggle. There is a struggle between the two. There is a struggle between the mind. There is a struggle between the heart. One is torn in one way or another. Sometimes it is a karmic effect that brings forward this way. For instance, if a human is born into a family that has very strong beliefs, the human part may very much think or believe that it must follow along with those beliefs, even if the soul will say, come now, let us strike out on our own. Come now, I will assist you, I will open your mind and your eyes, look in this direction and that direction and beyond the next horizon. But the human must then follow in this way, and at times it unwittingly falls behind. It becomes more trapped by some of the other decisions that surround it, karmic decisions, if you like, little traps in which one forgets that one does, in fact, have free will. You see, free will comes with experience, and you must remember from life to life that you indeed have free will. Free will does not mean that you can do whatever you please. It means that you have access to your own will. It means that you have the ability to choose. It means that you have the ability to draw a breath of your own choosing, of your own depth, you see? So it does not simply mean do what you wish and it will all turn out because you are free after all. You are not that free. Perhaps you have noticed that by now. Perhaps you have noticed that try as you might, there are some things that continue to fall on your plate, insisting that you look or do or be taking care of them. So free will involves the will itself. The more divine will that you have, the more free will that you have. The more free will that you have, the more divinity that you have in order to express the will. So there are many different kinds of will. They are all near, they are all accessible. But how much of each one you are able to draw to you, that is something that is a little bit earned, if you like. It is a little bit like a quotient of light. Very many subtleties, you see. It is not a point system. It is not a pass or fail system. Oh, a variety, very, very subtle of different lights and colors and frequencies is the will. But once one has exercised the will, then that feeling, that knowing, there is nothing like it, as they say. And both the soul and the human will draw it to itself and wish more and more of that. The soul then continues to offer itself to bring light, to bring truth, to bring awareness, to open doors and windows, to say, look here, look there, explore this, taste that. Here the soul is very, very active with the human, and for the most part the human is also interested as well. Again, not in all cases. Here we can draw parallels. Here you can see examples in your life of cases in which this works very, very excellent. 
and cases in which it does not at all. The aspects of the soul then continue to take delight in itself and to reveal codes, depths, places, parameters by which light can know itself. And then again, the step back. Near the time of the late twenties, then, the human being has become a full human being. It has come into adulthood. When does a human being come into adulthood? When the soul determines that it has. It has very little to do with the chronological age. Perhaps you have noticed that by now. The fact that one will turn 17 or 18 or 21 or 50 does not determine that one has become adult or entered the maturation process. So it has much more to do a little bit with the heredity of the body itself and its characteristics and patterns, but more to do with the soul's ability to commune with the human. At a certain point, it is the soul then that determines that a certain level of maturity or aliveness has taken place. And now the human is an adult. Now, this is a very important time, you see, because it is a threshold for some, it is a boundary for others. Perhaps you have noticed that there are some that cease to grow altogether at a certain point. It is as if they have come to a certain place and can go no further. It is invisible before them, as if there was an invisible force field holding them back, an invisible threshold that they will not cross perhaps a fear on their part that there is an abyss waiting for them, that they will fall into nothingness or that they will surely fail at life if they were to take their next step. So here you find the first area that we will call, well, a comfort zone. It is not as comfortable for the soul, for we have said earlier that the soul wishes to progress, to discover, it is curious, it is amazed by life and by the earth. But the human... At times, well, it is a little bit like a donkey, or perhaps we could say an ass, hm? It will simply not take another step forward. Matters not what is the carrot or the stick, as they say. If this be the case, well, the soul will then move on to continue to animate other aspects, other humans. But we have said earlier that the soul is capable of animating many different human lifetimes at once. If the soul can not make progress with the human, it will allow it to remain in its mechanistic state, the automaton that it has become, knowing that its lifespan will suffice and it will then move, movement gracefully to animate one or more human characteristics associated with the soul and embodied elsewhere. Again, as we have said earlier, this is not an abandonment of the one human. It is more an acceptance. It is more to say this road has taken us as far as we can go now and the next road will join. And so the soul will move from time to time, revisiting at particular junctures, as we said before. Remember that we said that there are particular junctures, crossroads, in which more can be accomplished and not less. At these carefully orchestrated and timed junctures and crossroads, the soul will return to see if there has been progress, to see if there is movement, to see if there can be animation that can be accomplished, to see what can be instilled in the being, and... If there is the possibility, then by all means the soul will offer itself wholly and completely. And if there is not, well, the soul will continue about its awareness, returning at the next time or the next crossroads. So here you begin to see, sweet ones, that there is a great difference between an ordinary life and an extraordinary life. An extraordinary life is one that is orchestrated and partnered by both human 
aspects, characteristics, patterns, past lives, heredities and DNAs, and the soul. The soul is not a surgeon. It will not go into the spinal column and activate DNA or accelerate it simply for the sake of doing so because it can. It has great respect for the vehicle. You see, if the soul were to over animate, overstimulate the human aspect, well, I tell you that it would be more of a detriment than not. Here in this case, it is the human that can become more prone to illness. The human can then age prematurely. The human can then draw to itself cancers and other errant cells that it does not know how to report or how to restore for itself. So it is not simply that a very exuberant or interested soul can go under the hood as it would be to tune it up a little bit. However, these are possible as well. It is possible. And again, the importance here is at particular crossroads and junctures where much more can be accomplished than at other times. These take all different manner of appearance. For instance, every seven years in a life is a very important crossroads. Every 13 years is another important. And where all these crisscross, well, these two then become very, very aware. Certainly you know by now that other planets affect the earth the movements of the stars and the suns and the moons, and at particular junctures, these two then are of interest to the soul, for the soul can use the energies of other celestial bodies, the forces of nature beyond the forces of the earth itself, to work with human, to work, to animate, to accelerate, you see? So it is not simply that the soul will give up on the life and say, oh, well then, that's as far as you can come along, you're on your own. No, it is not like that. It is indeed a divine life, every life purposeful, worthy, and deserving of every possibility, of every probability, and of every chance. That is why perhaps you know by now that it is never too late to change, as they say. It is never ever too late, for it is never ever too early, so it cannot be too late. It is then at the soul's discretion, and the soul is master at this. Many souls are master souls, not all of them, but there are master souls. Master souls are those not simply that animate a body well or like that. Master souls are those that have combined with humanity in such a way as to have brought enlightenment in a very great way to the earth, to many different lifetimes. They are those that have animated or reanimated bodies, brought them back from death, if you like. Now here we are not speaking only of the death of the body, we are speaking of the death of a lifetime. A lifetime that has lost its purpose is a death, you see? And this has little to do with what one, one does each and every day. Even if you will do the same routine by day, it is not the death of a life. The death of a life is when there is little life force to animate. It is when the soul can no longer see, the eyes become opaque, and all manner of true life force vitality begin to shut down. So a death, if you like, can happen very early in life in some, even if the bodies will continue for many, many years after that. As far as the soul is concerned, it is a dead life. When you count how many lifetimes you have had, the soul counts aliveness. It does not count ones in which simply the body continues to function, you see? Now then, the soul continues to observe the life and to bring possibility and probability to the now animated or awakened life, for that is what we are concentrating on. We have spoken clearly and sufficiently regarding what happens when a soul cannot reanimate a body 
or alive. So here perhaps we will set that aspect of the condition of our speaking aside. Near the end of the twenties then we continue and now the body begins to have a purpose. It begins to know who it is and what it is. It begins to look both inward and outward. It sees that there is life, that there is purpose. It begins to compare itself outwardly to other humans and inwardly to other lifetimes that it has had. Now, much of the time this is not aware to the human self or it is aware during the dream state. And so you may find in these cases that the young 30-year-old, the tri-scenarian, if you like, now begins in the dream state, in the sleep state, to find a certain awareness, a contentment for life, certain desires to accomplish, or a discontent for life as well. It becomes discontent with its surroundings, with its choices, and it begins to feel restless. The thirties then bring a certain restlessness of life. Yes, it seems as if one ought to settle down by then and begin to raise other young humans and such. And more of the time that is the case. But the spirit within the being, the part that wishes to be engaged and animated in life, this part in particular then feels restless. If it cannot change its outer circumstances, and much of the time it cannot, and sometimes at the purpose, direction or misdirection as it would be, of the soul, then it begins to look inward. Yes, yes. The human allows, encourages to see what is within. For the first time for some, it begins to look truly into the treasure within. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? Why am I here? And what is to become of me? What do I know? And how unfathomable is what I do not know? Who has created me or that or us? Where have we come from? You see, some of the reason why you do not know all of your history is because it serves you at this time. It serves humanity. It was not always the case and it will not always be the case. But it serves humanity to wonder, to scratch at its surface, to crave. For earlier we said that the human being left to its own devices can become somewhat lazy in the process. Well, something about not knowing where it is or if it is orphaned or marooned or what it would be, something regarding that causes, instills passion within the human to seek more. And if it cannot find what it seeks without, then it continues to look and to seek within. And so it finds within itself those places, those areas where this or that can be known. It goes about the inner search and the outer walk. And those that are the wisest among them combine the two or find themselves asking the true and correct inner questions and guided to find some of the answers without. Depending upon how the being is aligned, the soul will either guide one toward an outer teacher or an inner teacher, sometimes both, sometimes both together at once or in succession. This, again, is guided by the soul. Moments of serendipity, moments in which a past life or an awareness, or one has the deja vu, I know you, I have seen you, I have met you, I remember you, from another life. It is meaningful, it is purposeful. These moments are orchestrated, carefully manipulated, if you like, by the soul to bring about the highest results, the most purposeful results. So for those who are interested, then, the search is on, as it would be. For some, it is almost as if it is a race. What can I know, and where can I go, and what can I study? And the soul hungers, and yearns, and wants, and craves, and hurts. Almost as if it were an injury. 
almost as if it were a physical pain. Now, truly, the soul hurts. Yes, darkness in the dark night of the soul. Light just around the corner, just around the bend, just through the corridor. Oh, but where is it? Where is the match that lights the candle? And so the soul suffers for a little while. Now, in what way does the soul suffer? Can you imagine? Certainly you understand human suffering. What is the suffering of a soul, then? It is not the same as the tortured thoughts of a human feeling or of a human body. For the soul, it is to not know, to not feel. There is a certain blindness, and yes, blindness is dark. And so the soul feels darkened in some ways, a little bit separated. For the soul, death as well, is to not feel connected to the all and to the all things. It begins to lose or think that it has lost that binding element. The soul is wise, and a part of the soul knows and sees and understands the process, certainly much more than the human does. But the process is the process, and there is wisdom in this as well. And so the soul lies in wait of the reawakening of the human, and the human lies in wait of assistance from the soul, one waiting for the other, each unable to speak as it would be. And silence then, the waiting of the light, the waiting of the reawakening of the small voice within. What will it say when it finally awakens? What truth will it bring? What key to liberate will it have? And what will that liberation look like? What will the next step look like beyond the point of darkness? So now we have approached the point of no return, the point of no going forward and no going backward, the zero point, the unknown meeting the known, and the known discovering that after all is said and done, it has learned nothing, it has become nothing. Hmm. A difficult place to pause, and yet we will pause here just the same, for it is well for you to contemplate this, to know it and to feel it for a time to reminisce from these points of this life or another life, to call to yourself great light at this point in the horizon. We will come together again soon, sweet ones. You have my promise upon it, and that I will complete the story that we are unfolding for you, so that you will know it and feel it and trust it too. <laughs>